Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Leora Simazar, and I am the VP of Product at Easy Health and a longtime WIT member. I also run the LA chapter of Women in Product. And I wanted to give you guys a little bit of background about this panel and why it's such an important topic and why we're here. A few months ago, uh, WIP had a panel about negotiating your offer, a uh, very timely topic right now with everything shifting in the tech world. And what we found in that panel is that so many of the questions were really about equity. Um, people wanted to know about how to evaluate their equity offers, how to negotiate their equity offers, and also like what we found is that people didn't really know what was in their equity contract. And what you'll hear from myself and our two phenomenal panelists, Melody and Ling, is that the equity contract is actually extremely important and knowing what you're signing is also extremely important. And so few people know what they're getting into. And when I think about my own experience, some of the, the funny things that have happened to me, the things I've read about and the women I've advised, I, I really feel like there's like a big gap in what, in, in what employees understand about something that could make or break their wealth. Like this is the way that employees are able to achieve the American dream through a startup. And if you don't understand that, it can end up doing the opposite and really, and really costing you. So what we really need here is more literacy and what better way to do that than with a lawyer and with an industry expert. And today we have exactly both. Um, so I'd love to introduce you to our lawyer, Melody Horsandy. Melody comes to us uh, from, she's currently a director of legal at Whatnot. And she's the first legal hire for the startup community marketplace. But previously she was a corporate associate at Fenwick. Um, Mel, do you want to talk a little bit about your background? Because I know you've spent a lot of time writing these contracts. Sure, yeah. So up until about three weeks ago, I was a corporate associate at Fenwick & West. Uh, I've been practicing for about six years. Um, at Fenwick, I mostly represented companies as well as uh, VCs um, with regards to anything from financings to incorporation to day-to-day -day corporate needs, anything and everything in a company's life cycle kind of came through us. And I like to say that I acted as in-house counsel, um, but really as their outside counsel, as companies were really just getting started and um, forming and, and kicking things off the ground from, like I said, formation where nothing existed and two founders came to me with an idea to um, through multiple rounds of financing, through point of sale or IPO. Um, so I'm regularly dealing with equity incentive plans and um, issuing options and other types of equity. Um, so really excited about this panel and excited to give you all some information on things to look out for. And, and just to, to, to finish that off, recently started a new job as the director of legal at um, Whatnot, which is a community marketplace to buy and sell collector's items. I like to call it the combination of eBay and QVC because um, there's a live shopping component. Um, they were a former client of mine and um, a company that I actually incorporated a few years back. So I'm excited to join them in, in uh, their startup life cycle. They're a Series C company today and um, that's just kicking off now. Awesome. Thank you, Mel. And we also have Ling joining us. Ling comes to us from Vested as the chief marketing officer. And Vested is one of the companies that's actually really focused on exactly this space and solving some of the problems we're going to talk about with employees. Ling, I'd, I'd love to have you tell us more about your background. Yeah, for sure. And um, I'm so happy to be here. And, you know, Melody, it's wonderful to hear your background. I mean, we all need an attorney friend, <laughs> especially navigating sort of this really complex topic. Um, so, yeah, I head up marketing at Vested and we actually we are a startup um, helping startup employees get more out of their stock options. Um, so my career actually started in um, consulting and working with really massive, you know, Fortune 100 companies with their go to market strategy. Um, um, but I had always been sort of been an entrepreneur at heart. So um, I made a jump to a baby care startup um, not that long ago. And uh, that baby care startup is doing great. But it's 
where I kind of recognized just how murky and convoluted the equity compensation topic is. Um, and when I delve into the, the data, I mean, it's really staggering. Um, Leora, you, you mentioned that this is really a very important part of many people's American dream. And it's true. And when you look at the numbers, right, 60% of stock options are abandoned. That means what, three in five people, you know, three in five of you or I, like these entrepreneurs walk away from the wealth that they helped to build. Um, and so for me, there's an incredibly mission driven aspect of it all, which is, you know, how do we help people like the average American doesn't have $40,000 lying around waiting to exercise. And it's a huge risk to ask someone to take after spending sort of years of their lives at a place. Um, so that's exactly what Vested tries to do is by providing knowledge and capital um, to bridge the gap. And um, a lot of the topics that, that uh, I know we have a really packed agenda and like this is something I'm really enthusiastic about. And um, I'm really, uh, you know, I hope I only wish there are more events like this. You know, I think uh, everybody could benefit from um, knowledge that we're going to cover. Uh, and thank you. And yes, th there is a super packed agenda today. We're going to cover a lot of topics and I guarantee you there will be enough left over for another, for another panel. Um, but one thing that's unique about this panel is that there's a lot of material um, to cover. And so we're actually going to have a couple slides to assist us throughout this. The slides will be sent out. So you don't, shouldn't feel like you have to take like notes on everything written on the slides. Um, we'll be sending them out. So just a heads up, enjoy the session. If there's anything that we say you want to note, feel free to do that. But if it's on the slides, you're going to be getting those after the session. So today we're going to talk about, like try to focus on really top core topics. The first is evaluating an offer. So how do you know if your offer is any good? Um, then we're going to do some stock options contract prep. This is something everybody needs to know before signing a stock options contract. Then we're going to get into like exercise, which is how you get your equity. Um, and then we're going to kind of go into trends in the market and like how do these little clauses in your contract translate into real world events. So I'd love to start off with a discussion of like, how, how do you know if your equity offer is good? Like, what are some of the things that you think about to know like, hey, like I have a good offer. I've, I've really done a good job negotiating versus like, this isn't competitive. I can do better elsewhere. Especially when you have like this like very arbitrary number of stock options from like this very arbitrary number of total shares. Like how, how do you, what do you do with that? Uh, Ling, do you want to like kick us off? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I mean, I think this is like a a really important, it's such a foundational question, but to answer it really well, there are a couple of dimensions. The first one is probably just mathematically thinking through the value of it, right? So mathematically, uh, you could think of it as the FMV uh, share, fair market value, which is de decided by the last round of 409A uh, assessment um, times the total number of options you're, you're granted, right? So that's like the, the most basic mathematical ways to think about it. Um, you could also think about sort of last round preferred price or just the, the likely value of that, the options that you have um, and what is sort of how is the market valuing in that. Um, and there are a couple of secondary sort of liquidity financing places that are um, giving valuations where wherever sort of there are buyers for these shares, you can sort of get a sense as to what the these are, are worth. Um, but there is sort of this mathematical way to just calculate um, the, the dollar value of the options as they stand today. Um, I also want to highlight, I mean, going, going a little bit outside of the mathematical bit, I actually think, you know, what, what I see a lot of our uh, customers and, and my friends um, think about too is like, you know, you want to also understand the fundamentals of the business. Like you want to know your number of options and the total outstanding shares to understand your percentage ownership of the company. And, you know, there are good benchmark sets out there you can find like for a senior PM for a Series B company at your tenure, what is the ballpark that you can get? And that's definitely do that research. But I think also sort of have a point of view on how confident you are about the sector or industry where it's going and what is this company's unique um, 
value proposition. Like what's the mode essentially that will help it win, right? And because the earlier you go, um, sort of the more risk you're taking on and you should also be uh, compensated for the risk that you're taking on. So depending on the risk profile, sort of your confidence with the company, you can come to a um, assessment as to sort of your value uh, to the company and never be sort of shy about negotiating. Um, I think one of the biggest thing is sort of getting understanding sort of just the, the, the benchmark, the ballpark um, uh, equity ownership percentage and sort of negotiating um, on that. And I'd love to like ask a clarifying question and then and then add a comment. So when you talk about valuing your shares at the fair market value, isn't that typically the strike price at, as well? So isn't that really like, it, isn't that calculation really the exercise cost that you're going to have to put up to get the shares? Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So the FMV is what you will pay to, um, to, to exercise, to turn your options into actual shares. And then the, the, I, I've seen a lot of in, employers say, look, the last round preferred price is this, and that's the per share cost uh, or per share value. So if, you, um, if you were granted, let's just say a hundred shares and the FMV is a dollar, right? You, you will spend a hundred dollars total to exercise. Now the employer may say, look, last round preferred, the investors paid $10. So really it's worth a thousand dollars. And that means you, you know, you pocket $900 um, of gain, but it's far, it's not clear or straightforward like that at all. Most of the times you cannot uh, fetch that last round preferred price. Um, and also when you exercise, there's pretty hefty um, tax implication. Um, the higher sort of the, the last round or uh, the, when, when you finally exercise, the higher the difference is, the more tax you will end up paying. So there are all these considerations that are baked into um, the, the value of your options. Yeah. And I want to add to that, like one thing that I found to be helpful is that, so you start off, definitely you want to know what percentage of the company you own, especially if you're like coming in earlier stage. I think it gets a little bit harder later on, but you have to keep in mind that there's going to be dilution with every funding round. So if you think these, this company is going to go through three, four funding rounds before they have a liquidity event, you need to account for it. There's going to be dilution every single time. And it, it also comes down to like, are those founders going to re-up you, you know, over the years, like to help you like compensate for some of that dilution because some founders will. Um, one specific strategy that I found to be helpful is I asked them what their like exit projections are. So like, how, like, how do you think this company can exit? And what do you think like a possible valuation would be at that point? And then I work back into, okay, if I own this percentage of the company today and we go through such and such amount of, of dilution, then this is what like my best case scenario is. And I use that to communicate with the person I'm negotiating with about, okay, so this is what you're telling me this offer is worth. I think that we can make this more interesting or more compelling. Uh, and that like I've, I've had success doing that, but it's it's a very murky calculation. Melody, is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, just to be like a little more technical about it and, and break down some of these terms. When we keep talking about fair market value, what happens with companies is usually after a financing round, you'll bring in a third party valuation firm to, to price the equity. So let's say the equity was worth $100 in the most recent round. Usually the fair market value, the strike price that's going to be put on your shares is somewhere between, and this is, a rough, this is rough, but 20 to 35% of that. And there's, it's, it, this is considered a discount for lack of marketability at the time in which you're getting your shares. Um, and, and so that strike price, and Lior and Link covered this already, but that strike price is different from, I think, how you should maybe be thinking about the long-term value of your equity, which usually companies will peg to the most recent preferred price. Um, yeah. And oftentimes you can ask for these things. Like you should be able to ask like what the number of fully diluted um, outstanding shares are, right? Like these are questions you should be able to ask to help you contextualize what you're getting. Because a lot of founders just say like, you're, you're going to get 10,000 options. Like, what does that mean? Like, how do I think about that? Like definitely ask for more context. And, and something else to flag on that note as well is I would kind of ask where they are in their life cycle. Like you could be interviewing at a time in which they are going through a round of financing. They could have just finished a round of financing. They may be kicking off a round of financing as you're interviewing. And all of that matters because it does affect 
this strike price, this fair market value that gets put on your shares. And so in a best case scenario, you're getting your equity before a round happens because if you think about it, the value of the equity is less relative to what it's about to become because of the money that's being injected into the company. And sometimes I've seen cases where companies will forget about the promise they just made of equity to an employee and you know, six months go by and a financing has happened and this employee has missed out on the earlier strike price just because of when the board decided to grant the equity. That's exactly what happened to me in my last role. Oh, no, um, I had twice my strike price. Yeah. And so when that happens, I think it's completely fair to say, hey, you I, I signed an offer letter six months ago. This financing happened two months ago. You need to find a way to, to true me up. Um, and usually companies get a little scared in those moments and they'll work with you and figure something out. I really wish I had known that five years ago when it, when it happened, because that, that's a very helpful tip. Um, so I, I just want to touch on one last thing, which is how do I know if it's competitive? And, and Ling kind of mentioned like doing your research. Uh, we've worked with organizations in the past, like 81 cents um, and other tools online that help you contextualize that. So definitely make sure to look into exactly what Ling said. Like I really want to emphasize, like do your research about if the percentage ownership of the company you're getting is, is, is typical for the role you're going into. And they have tons of resources that are like very clear about how, how much PMs earn if they're the first PM or if they're coming in at series C, if they're a junior, if they're a VP, you know, all of these are things that um, you can look up and that people have um, posted about in the past. So, one thing that I don't hear people talk about is the stock options contract. And that's really what we want to get into today. And I want to kick this off by saying that everyone should see their stock options contract before they sign an offer. Uh, you're going to sign one a couple months down the line when you get, when the board approves your grant and you get it, but you should know what that looks like before you get your offer. And every time I've asked a founder, they've been surprised. It is very clear that this is not the norm and it should be. So, Everyone, if you are if you are making an offer, sorry, my dogs are making a lot of noise. Uh, so we're gonna move on. There we go. So let's go through like what those requirements are. Melody, can you walk us through what the best eclipse? Yep, yeah, I'll I'll kick it off from here. Um, so standard things to look for in a contract. Obviously, this is not a one size fits all. But I would say what you will typically see is a four year vesting schedule generally with a one year cliff, meaning shares wouldn't vest until you've been at the company for 12 months. But from that point forward, it would vest on a monthly basis over the course of the next three years. Um, that's most standard. There are other variations um, where you might vest quarterly, you might have no cliff. Typically, if you've been with a company and you're getting re-upped or promoted or whatever the case may be, in that case, cliffs don't usually exist because you've already been with the company and they're, they're no longer testing you to make sure you, you know, you're there to, to really be there for the long haul. Um, other things to look for, standard in an equity incentive plan, baseline is... If you were to leave, you usually have 90 days um, to exercise any vested stock options you might receive. Um, that, given market conditions today, this kind of has changed. But over the course of the last few years with how um, well tech companies have done, they've been pretty employer friendly. And so a lot of them have extended that post-termination exercise window to anywhere from, you know, six years to 10 years. Um, there's usually a, a 10 year expiration from the date that you receive your grant, um, on that equity. So if you've been with a company for 10 years and you haven't exercised, um, fun fact that it expires and you're no longer eligible to ever exercise or receive that equity. And that like has happened, right? There have been 10 years that have lost, like some, some startups don't IPO in that 10 year window. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, definitely something to look out for. If you work for a for, you know, if you work for a good company in that case, and if there were, there's, it still seemed like there was longevity and, and they were going places, you'd probably get a new grant. Um, but there are other considerations in that case. You know, if you got a grant 10 years prior, the strike price is probably going to be pretty different than what it looks like 10 years later. Um, other things to think about, 
Um, should we talk a little bit about, you know, exercise ability? Is that a, is this a good place to do that? Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, okay. but I think like, uh, yeah, I, go ahead, think. Oh, sorry. I was going to chime in on, and on this PTE window thing. I mean, I, it, it works to the company's benefit, right? To, to sort of give the 90 day window. And I think there's been, well, there are different schools of thoughts, but there is one school of thought, which is, you know, you've got the, these evil general counsels or CFOs who uh, they recycle the shares. So if you kind of don't exercise them, they go back onto the cap table, it gets recycled. I think more and more companies are sort of looking to not do that because they, they need good strong retention strategies and this is the best way for uh, for incentive alignment um but um i was also going to say the the um sorry i lost my train of thought there was something that melody said i want to piggy uh back off i'm sure it will come back to me but this pte window thing is actually at times negotiable um so if you notice that you have 90 days don't be shy to say hey you know i see a lot of companies moving towards the 10-year window why not that ah Sorry, the thought just came back to me um, around the re-upping grant, um, which is, you know, companies used to take four to six years to IPO. Now it's 10 to 12 years because of all the influx of venture capital, right? Private private um, funding, and they can stay private for longer. And this actually creates a golden handcuff. Like we heard about it with Uber because um, the exercise cost is high and or you're, we'll, we'll get into this, but you want to you don't want to exercise until there's a liquidity event or when you leave. So as a result, you feel stuck. You, you, you know, you stay in the company way beyond what the career trajectory was carrying you. Um, and I've interviewed a lot of customers who actually felt that way. Um, and so in circumstances like this, it's helpful to actually evaluate your, your risk profile and really think critically about, you know, if you're feeling like, a particular company is stagnant, but um, you have like a large option grant. It's it's not a bad idea to think, you know, what other opportunities might you have and what are the ways you can sort of get financing to exercise so that you're holding on to the upside without sort of being stuck there forever. Yeah, uh, and that's, that's exactly right. And I think that that's what a lot of like, a lot of the things that made me really pay attention to my equity package are hearing some of the horror stories of people who did get stuck and like like get they I think they call it like golden handcuffs, right? Or like you can't leave because you just have so much money on the line. So Mel covered some of like the vesting cliff. And I want us to bookmark these and keep these in mind because we're gonna go back to and look at what happens when things don't look standard. And like what how do, how does that impact you? Um and so one, like just two things that I want to call out here is um, for post-termination expiration window, I believe that the 90-day the 90-day um, the has a tax implication. So I think that companies that extend from 90 days to, um, I think the legal maximum is 10, but I'm not positive, that they actually have some sort of tax accounting they have to do for that, and which is why a lot of companies have shied away from it. So it's not just regain, re putting those options back on the cap table, which some has definitely been like a controversial thing that Ling exactly nailed. But also, I think there's like tax and accounting challenges that can prevent a company from doing that, even if they want to. Um, and early exercise is another one of those things that also can a lot of companies don't offer it even though it can be tax advantageous. If you think the company is going to be very successful, you can go ahead and exercise before your, um, your fair market value has gone up and avoid a tax bill. But a lot of companies don't offer it because they have to do quite a bit of accounting work on their end uh, to maintain that, especially if you leave before you've vested all of the options you have exercised. Um, so a lot of companies don't offer, but if they do, it's a sign that they're really looking to be employee friendly with their contracts. Uh, so any, anything else that we should cover here before we go on to our next topic? Um, I'd say, yeah, go ahead, Ling. No, you go ahead. I was just going to um, add that in some rare cases also and things to look for acceleration terms, I'd say if you're coming in a, at a higher level, um, so maybe like VP or executive level, um, there is an opportunity to get an acceleration on your vesting, which would mean 
generally double trigger acceleration, which would mean that in the case that the company sells and you are terminated generally within 12 months of that sale, all of your shares would accelerate. Um, double trigger acceleration is, I'd say it's somewhat common when you are coming in at a pretty high level. I don't think it's, it's generally handed out um, to all employees. So it's bargained for and not something that I think you can always ask for, but it is something to consider. Um, and I have seen companies that have more freely given it out. So always worth, worth asking the question um, at the very least. I'd love to just take this opportunity to answer a couple questions in the chat. Uh, so Jillian has asked, could you still exercise your options even if they haven't gone public? Yeah, so I think we're, we probably were gonna wanna take a step back and talk about equity types and then get into exercisability. But um, yes, the I'd say this, the standard way that this works, um, unless you have special rights is you're able to exercise any shares that have vested. Um, people generally wait to exercise um, at the point in which they've terminated or at the point in which the company's about to go public or there's some liquidity event, but you can exercise at any point in which your shares have vested. If the company hasn't gone public, probably better off in some ways because of the tax implications, which we'll get into um, shortly. Yeah, and in fact, once it's gone public, when you exercise, there's typically a lockup period in which you can't liquidate your shares. And so for a lot of companies, like all birds dropped 60% after it went public, right? So in which case, you're probably better off exercising and selling before it went IPO. So really, this whole thing is like, you almost need a PhD in like risk analysis and sort of market sentiment to like really opt, get, get the most out of it. But there are some general guiding principles where, you know, you, uh, you won't be missing out on, um, by, by practicing. Uh, and I'd like to, uh, there's a lot of questions in the chat and some we'll get to later on. So I'm not going necessarily in order, but I think too that we should be able to answer pretty quickly. Uh, Rain has asked what amount of time might be considered an early timeline to exercise options. I think any time before it's vested would be considered early exercise. Um, so sometimes they let you do it at the time of grant. It's I, I've worked for several companies and none of them have ever allowed it. So it's not very common. Um, I think Uber may have allowed certain employees to do it is my understanding, but um, any time it's before it exercise. And Erica asked a question about RSUs. Melody um, Ling, maybe you guys can answer because I can't answer for RSUs, but she wants to know how long you have to stay to get all of your RSUs. Is that um, different from the cliff you would see for stock options? So the, the concept of vesting with RSUs is the same. Um, RSUs work a little differently because you don't have to exercise them. You're not paying out of pocket to receive them, but the tax implications are different. You're paying, you're paying taxes as the RSUs vest. Um, because of that fact, generally the vesting schedule differs in that RSUs get granted on like a quarterly basis as opposed to like a monthly basis because you don't want to be paying taxes on a monthly basis. Um, but it's it's the same idea. So if RSUs were supposed to vest over a four year period, you'd have to stay for the four years to get all four, all all of the RSUs that have been granted to you. Yeah, and I think this is why looking at these key terms of the contract, it's it's not just important to make sure they're standard, but also so you know what you're signing up for. So like I talked to someone who had a five year vesting schedule. Like that changes how you think about it. Like you can have a less than one year cliff. It's super rare, but it's, it's still yeah. something to look at. You might not have monthly or quarterly, like you might not have evenly allocated vesting, like at Snapchat. So that's something that we're going to want to look at. Uh, like all of these are things that can impact how much equity you leave with when you leave. So it's not just the amount of equity you've negotiated. It's also like how that equity is dispensed to you. Yeah, that five. Yeah, that's so. Yeah, that's so interesting. I got like, her to negotiate it out, so we're good. She she let, she went in with a four year contract, but they wanted to give her a five year uh, five yeah, year. Yeah, and it's such a small thing, but you're effectively docked what twenty percent of your pay, right? It's like super sneaky. Um, I mean, the yeah. typical millennial staying at a company for two years, so you have to really think about that when you look at a, a four year schedule. Like you're really not signing up to get four years. Yeah. 
I want to add one,、uh, you know, in the green flag bucket. You know, early exercise being one. The other one is net exercise. This is also not that common, but、um, effectively, effectively, it means、uh, giving up some of your options as a way to to sort of pay for the strike price for the remaining options. So effectively, you're doing an exchange with the company such that they pay.、Um, To, for you to access, so there's no cash outlay essentially.、Um, mm-hmm. Also, not super common, but it could be really neat, especially if you don't want to sort of put down your own hard-earned money、uh, towards options. So I, I would caution the net exercise approach, just because I think you get really、um, you lose out on the potential of a lot of options doing it that way, just because. The net exercise is pegged to the strike price and not the most recent preferred price. The strike price, like I said, which could be twenty percent of whatever the most recent、um, preferred price was, and so you're 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 paying a lot extra in shares to not have to cough up any cash to to then receive the equity. So I wouldn't, unless you're really strapped for cash and it was your only way to do it, I would not recommend it. Right, because if you're buying the equity, it means you think that it's going to be more valuable in the future. So if you're also spending that equity and buying it, I, I agree. It, it really only makes sense if you're strapped for cash. Yeah. So now let's talk about exercising. So we we've kind of built up to this, like what happens when you get the contract. But in order to really get any equity, you have to exercise.、Um, and equity doesn't even mean that you've made money. Like that that still comes later. So. When do you exercise, and like, what does that mean? Can you guys walk us through? Like, I've we've identified here like four different stages、um, for when you can exercise. Like, how, like, how do you decide what the right time is to exercise your options, and and kind of what's the norm? Like, Melody said, most people do it when they leave. Like, what does that look like? Yeah, I'm gonna. If if it's okay with you, I want to take one quick step back because it does affect、yeah. a lot of a lot of this. Um, just to differentiate between the types of options you can get,、um, because it does then affect how the taxes play out with all of this exercisability.、Um, I'm going to focus on options、um, primarily, but there's there's two types of options you can get. One is an ISO, the other is an ENSO, an incentive stock option or a non-qualified stock option. As an employee of a company, you are entitled to ISOs. If you are not an employee, you cannot receive ISOs. All of this comes down to taxes, which I will get into in a second. So, if you're a consultant, an advisor, anything other than an employee, you would be receiving NSOs. The benefit of an ISO is if you hold the ISO for two years from the date of grant and one year from the date of exercise, you do not have to pay income tax on the difference between the strike price and the fair market value when you exercise the shares. With an ENSO, no matter what, when you do decide to exercise, you have to pay income tax on the discrepancy between your strike price and the fair market value of the shares, which can be pretty significant. So I'd say if all works out well, an ISO is is the way to go.、Um, and if you're working for if you're fully employed by a company, this shouldn't be an issue, but something to to think about.、Um, Can I clarify one part? Yeah. So Kat just asked the question that I definitely have as well. Yeah.、So、you said that for an ISO, you don't have to pay the income tax on the difference between the strike price and the fair market value, but you could still be on the hook for AMT, right? So it's not tax free. Yeah. So yes. Thank you. And and let me clarify that. So with ISOs,、um, at the point in which you exercise, there's something called an alternative minimum tax,、um, which was brought in by Uh, the government to ensure that wealthy people didn't get away with not paying taxes、um, if they could, in fact, afford to pay those taxes. The problem is when you work for a successful company、um, and your equity has significantly increased in value, that monetary amount gets placed on on the AMT threshold. So I don't know the specifics. I apologize, but if you exceed a certain amount in terms of annual income. You are subject to AMT tax,、um, which again could be pretty con- pretty significant. Not something that I can easily calculate for you in this panel, but something to think about. And there are AMT calculators online, and, and you should definitely talk to an accountant about this if it does come up.、Um, but yes, absolutely, Kat. Thanks for flagging.、Um, when you do exercise, if you do hold an ISO and it is worth a lot of money, 
um, you would be subject to AMT taxes. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. And I think that that's like the biggest kind of like landmine when it comes to stock options is that these taxes can eclipse your salary if the company is successful. And that, that means that there's a lot of people who, who can't afford it. And that's why I think knowing when to exercise is really important for a lot of you. Like I have in the past exercised while I was still at a company. Um, and I made the choice to exercise around the time of vesting because I didn't want the fair market value to go up so much that I would have a taxable event. Um, so like so far I've managed to kind of dodge AMT because it's never like it, that, that difference I've, I've managed to avoid having that huge gap. Um, but so, yeah, yeah, I think absolutely right. Like at time of vesting is a very financially prudent thing to do. Almost. I've also interviewed customers who said like, it's easier to basically set almost like a quarterly quarterly goal for yourself, right? Set aside savings so that you're exercising the quarter off. The downside, I think, Lior, you're also mentioning um, is one, again, going back to the risk because you're not as close to a liquidity event. And so there is a chance uh, that if your company goes belly up, right, all of that exercised cash w would mean nothing. Um, there, you know, smaller chance smaller risk of amt but i i want to call out i think particularly in this environment sort of in this you know public market tumbling lots of tech uh sort of slash in in valuation um it's not inconceivable that we may see some down rounds i mean in fact you know stripe is tr trading down what 40 percent Klarna is trading down 40 percent or so or maybe even more um so if you had exercised and sort of um, while you're vesting and it sort of has has a down round, the FMB would actually go back down. And so sometimes that's actually not a bad time to exercise either because you then effectively cut your tax. Um, but then it goes back to sort of your confidence interval on whether this company will have more down rounds and eventually go to zero or it's just a temporary correction um, soon to rebound. Exactly. I think that's what brings up a really good point, especially like especially in this market cycle. Like if exercising right now, you could be in a situation where your equity loses value without there even being a liquidity event. Like you could be you're you're and sometimes some companies are repricing options, right? So it's it's always the sooner you are the sooner you I guess it's like the trade-off is always between the tax that you could pay and how much risk you're taking on. Because the sooner you exercise, the more, the less information you have about whether or not that equity will ever be worth something. Yep. And just to, to round out my conversation about types of equity, somebody also asked about taxes on RSUs. RSUs, as I mentioned, they're taxable at the time that they vest and that's all subject to ordinary income tax. So the benefit is you're, you don't have to pay out of pocket to to exercise anything once it vests it's yours but you're paying pretty hefty taxes on those on those units um, and then the one other type of equity just to, to make sure i'm really covering it all is restricted stock um, that is something granted at a very early stage so if you're joining a company i'd say pre-seed um, before they've gone through a round of financing that's when you might um, receive a restricted stock award and with restricted stock um, somebody had asked about 83b elections you're, you're buying your stock outright. So in that case means you are buying it before any of the shares have actually vested and to receive the, there's a, there's a tax benefit to doing that. If you file an 83 B election where you are taxed on the day that you pay for the shares, as opposed to taxed as those shares vest, which over a four year period, if a company does well, the tax will continue to increase because the fair market value will increase over time. With the 83B election, if you file it within 30 days of paying for those shares, you get the benefit of it and you pay for the taxes on day one, which usually should be zero. Um, Leora, should I jump into the early exercise ability now, which was where we started? Yeah, definitely. Let's let, This is a good time for us to talk about like what happens when you exercise it at any point. Yeah. So I'll start with the, the first stage listed here, early exercise not something typically granted to employees. Um, I'd say it is something 
negotiated for and something that is saved for, again, more um, select hires, um, VPs, executives. But sometimes it happens. There are companies that you know, want to provide the benefit. What it means is that you get to exercise your shares before they have actually vested, which, as we discussed, could be incredibly beneficial from a tax standpoint, because if you're exercising on the date that it's granted, there's going to be no spread between the strike price and the fair market value at the time of exercise. So effectively, the taxes on that would be zero. Um, and that is, and in, and in that case, if you're exercising before shares have vested, again, you would need to think about an 83B election, which works to your benefit, where if you file it within 30 days of paying for those shares, you're paying the taxes on day one, as opposed to at each vesting event. And so what happens if you leave before that equity is vested? If you leave before the equity is vested, what's most typical is the equity incentive plan will say any shares that haven't vested at the point in which you are terminated would then be eligible to be repurchased by the company. And the company will typically have some amount of months to do so. If a company is, is smart, and most company ha companies do have this language today, they'll, they'll have something in the contract that says they're automatically opting to, to repurchase all of the options. They have to give you a check for those shares. So obviously they have to pay you back at the original value that you paid for those shares. Um, that's something to look out for when it happens. Um, but that is most typical. You would just you would just be paid back a check or a wire in the amount that you paid for any unvested shares. And then anything that's vested, you get to keep. So I, is there anything more? I want to talk about the ad departure because there's a lot of layoffs happening right now, which means a lot of people are looking at what happened, like, what do I do with this equity that I've vested over whatever period of time? So the first is what happens if you're laid off before the one year mark or before for most people, the cliff? Um, typically you wouldn't vest into anything. And so the shares that you thought you might be eligible for, you're no longer eligible for, and they would just go back into the company's pool. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of it. And if you've early exercised, same thing I just discussed, the company would pay you back for whatever you had paid for those shares and they would retrieve them. And how, like, on the legal side, are you seeing companies accelerate vesting? So if they laid you off after nine months, are they lowering the cliff so you can at least get those first nine months? Typically, no, um, but anything goes. So if you're negotiating a severance package, that might be something you want to flag where you say, hey, I want the, the nine months that I've been here to be vested equity. I want you to give me the opportunity to exercise it. And Anything can be made possible if you do ask for it, but I wouldn't say that that is the norm. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's my experience as well. I think in very rare cases, I've heard um, one-off arrangements where you know your ISOs got turned into NSOs and it became some kind of um, like service arrangement where you maybe stay on as an advisor, but that's that only ever happens to like very few people. Um, it doesn't hurt to ask though. Yep, exactly. So one thing I, I, I made a note to ask about is like, what is QSBS? Like, what is that? Uh, Ling, I think this is something that you and I have talked about. Yeah. Like, what does that mean? And like, how does that play into the, the, the wider landscape here? Yeah. So when you um, early exercise and there's a, a number of limitations around QSBS, it stands for qualifying small business stipend. I think you said stipend. Oh. Um, I'll start right. Um, and it basically, I, I think, you know, this is a very, um, this is a good area to consult an actual CPA and accountant because there's a lot of um, de sort of details here. But I think the general idea is that if you are exercised early enough and held the stock for five years, um, you could actually, when you eventually sell them, you're not liable for um, capital gains entirely. So not only are you not paying the short term, you're also not paying the long term. So effectively, you, you get all of the return. Now, of course, the, you, you do that by sort of exercising very early, taking a huge risk and holding on to that share 
for five years during which a lot of things can happen. Um, but I know um, a, a number of companies at seed stage or, or A round where their employees, early employees are sort of taking care, taking advantage of QSBS. Yeah, so for QS to be, for a company to be QSBS eligible to begin with, it has to have less than 50 million in assets. So as Ling pointed out, you're thinking, you know, seed A stage companies that don't have tons of money in venture capital yet um, or haven't you know, been operating for that long to exceed that 50 million. But otherwise, I think you covered it. Um, it's, a, it's a tax benefit at the end of the day. And I think the benefit exists on up to $10 million worth um, of equity. Um, up to those 10 million, you wouldn't be paying taxes. One of the things I love about this conversation is Melody Link, I hear you guys both repeating this idea that things are negotiable. And the reality is that like an important part of negotiating is to know what to ask for. And like, as we continue to have this conversation, what we're seeing is that there's a lot of different ways that things can go. And that gives employees the opportunity to ask their executive team whether or not something is available to them and whether or not something is an option to them. So uh, I know we have about 15 minutes left and I want to be mindful of QA as well. So one thing I'd really like to do is to talk about some of the interesting stories that have come out of this industry about how equity has gone wrong so that we can have something to remind us like, oh, I'm trying to avoid that from happening. Uh, and so I'm going to go back a couple steps um, to the... this and I'd love to like go like bullet by bullet like what happens when you don't have the standard thing and like just to start like for number one for the vesting schedule Ling you mentioned that like if you have a five-year vesting schedule you're getting like 20% less equity right um so like what just right just, yeah. <laughs> I think well, this like, is pretty, pretty um typically vesting schedule and, and cliff are not as negotiable just because it's a, a board approved thing and they to change they, they would have to change it for everyone right um but i think this is a good area to push if you're seeing something that's not not this right um because this is kind of the the, the standard the industry standard and then so vesting frequency i think most people are seeing quarterly or monthly vesting but it is important to know like if you have month, like I have a friend who has monthly vesting. And so she times when she's leaving the company, her current role based on when that, sorry, did I say monthly or quarterly? She has quarterly vesting and she's timing her departure to be after that three month period. So like, it doesn't, like if she leaves at the one and a half month mark, it makes, a, it makes sense for her to stay another month and a half or whatever it is just to get that extra quarter of equity. Uh, vesting allocation, I know Snapchat, doesn't have, has backloaded vesting. Does, do you either of you want to explain what that is and why it's problematic? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so like we said, typical vesting schedule, four years on, on a monthly basis, aside from that one-year cliff, when, when your equity is backloaded, a lot of that stock vests towards the back end of the vesting period. So if we're still keeping with a four-year vesting schedule, a higher amount of shares will start to vest, let's say in years three and four, as opposed to years one and two, to incentivize you to have to stay with Snapchat or whatever else the company is for a significant amount of time before any real equity starts to kick in and, and any real equity can become yours. Um, definitely something to look out for. It effectively means that your salary is lower, right? Because a lot of that equity is being backloaded into year three and four, years one and two, that's not that's not potential money in your pocket. Yeah, the idea. I'd say the way to combat this or to reframe is as a retention tactic, like set the re-upping refresher grant schedule, right? Decide on if at 18 months or 36 months, we're gonna talk about uh, uh, a refresher grant. This typically happens at promotions too, but in all of your OKR, like performance review cycles, don't like remember refresher grant is a, is a thing. And so this effectively also incentivizes retention without sort of docking your pay in the first couple of years. 
which is really unfair to the to the employee. Yeah. So in some, like every year at Snapchat, not all years at Snapchat are created equal. So like your last year of four um, will be, you'll get a lot more in equity than you will in your, possibly even your first two years combined, depending on how it's structured. Um, so we talked about early exercise quite a bit. I want to talk about any clauses that enable repurchasing exercise stock. Um, Melody and I have talked about this and I, I've seen two clauses that allow it. Definitely when you're looking at your stock options contract, you want to look at, at that clause. I, I had um, someone who was looking at an offer recently where the offer had like full repurchase within nine months of departure. If you see that, what that company is telling you is if you leave before an IPO or before a liquidity event, you don't own your stock. Like that's an extremely employee hostile clause. And it's been used to revoke equity from like Skype executives or like a famous example. Skype executives didn't make any money on the Microsoft acquisition um, because they had this like landmine of a clause that said, hey, we can buy back your stock at the original price you paid for it, which means you don't get to re realize any of the gains. I didn't even know about this before. It's... um. Yeah, if you look up Skype exec Microsoft acquisition, you'll you'll see more details than than the paraphrased version. But that like that was right around the time I was taking my first job, and I was like, whoa, like that. I don't want that to happen to me. Um, and it was something that like changed how I thought about my stock options. Yeah, um, yeah, I would, I would say it's not common. I've in the history of my career, I haven't seen it. Um, but another reason to definitely ask for the equity incentive plan and a copy of your option agreement to actually just check it out and make sure things are really standard in there. And the point in which you would do that is if you're negotiating your offer and you're talking about options and your offer letter comes your way and it says you're you know, subject to board approval, you're going to receive X number of options pursuant to the company's equity incentive plan. That's the point in which you'd say, okay, I'd like to see a copy of the plan and the agreement that I'm going to have to sign just to make sure it all checks out before I actually sign my offer letter. Yeah. Uh, I'd love, also, love to also talk about like 90 day expiration window versus like 10 year. Like, what does that mean? Like, is that something employees can advocate for? Like, can, can you guys walk us through, like, it, it, that's a pretty important thing as well that I think a lot of employees are realizing now. Like, what is that? How does that play in? Yeah. So, there's really, Melody, I'm curious your perspective, but really, really there's really no legal foundation, as I understand, for a 90-day. 90, 90 um, it, it's really just the the sort of the norm and industry standard. Mm -hmm. But more and more people are pushing towards and more companies are giving 10-year exercise window. I mean, is that right, Melody, on the legal foundation part? So the 90-day the <laughs> um, piece of this comes into play because of the distinction between ISOs and ENSOs. So right. To to remain ISO eligible, um, you have to exercise within 90 days if you're, if you're terminated. Otherwise, your grant would convert to an NSO, which, as I explained, could have other, you know, different tax implications. Um, at the end of the day, personally, I, I would still choose the extended period of time because you don't have to cough up, cough up cash before you know whether a company is going to go somewhere or not. I think it's ultimately worth it, but that is something to think about as you are debating whether to exercise within the 90 days or not. I right. Mean, that's a good point. Like within a 10 year horizon, you have time to hopefully see the company through and figure out if the stock is even worth anything. Yeah. I had, yeah, that's such a good point. Um, I had um, a customer tell me that, you know, she was an early founding member um, and after six or seven years, left um and you know she's she she had isos and she only 90 days and negotiated for to sort of to extend that into 10 years and for so all of that got converted into nso and she also took a 50 percent discount because the 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 board was like well we'll give you we'll make an exception but we'll also take back 
half of it. But the way she described it is, you know, like if you are not even confident enough of the company then to exercise, the further removed you are, the less visibility you have into the success and the operation of the company to the point that you really like need to rely on a liquidity event to feel comfortable, right? So in which case the 10 year uh, window really works in your benefit. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of uh, employees right now, given the recent rounds of layoffs, people who are in their 90 day window and um, sort of facing this slashing valuations, it's a pretty tough spot to be in, to be honest, because you, you kind of have to make a call. You only have 90 days to make a call. Um, and um, yeah, like having having 10 years um, would give you that many more opportunities to actually see a liquid a liquidity event. Uh, so on that note, Link, can you tell us a little bit about what Vesta does and how you guys help people who are in that 90 day window? Yeah, sure. Um, so we provide knowledge um, and tools as well as capital to, to exercise. And we actually started with the capital side of the business because there's just such an overwhelming need for it. But essentially, we uh, forward purchase um, your shares. So we, we front you the money to exercise. Um, and it's different from net exercising because we're not exactly trading at FNB. Uh, but essentially, you would take the money from Vested, you would use it to exercise, and you would hold on to your shares, right? You would hold on to it until there's a liquidity event. When there is, you know, if your company unfortunately goes belly up, you have no, it's non-recourse. So you have no obligation. You walk away for free. Essentially, you've just um, offloaded the risk. Uh, but if your company has goes IPO, SPAC, or whatever, there's a portion of shares that you previously agreed um, uh, was vested that you would then send to us. So in which case, you know, you, you don't get 100% of the upside anymore because you took that loan from vested. But um, a lot of people are telling me that that's a great way to retain the lion's share of your uh, upside while offloading um, risk entirely. Um, and the, I mean, I, I'm, I'm biased, obviously, but I, I think it's a, um, it's a pretty smart way to think about risk and how you want, may want to offload that. But but that aside, I mean, the, the there's a huge part of our business is actually building everything we were talking about today. Like we have a, a blog, we have a library, we're building some courses, we, we run um, monthly events, and then we have these tools, we have an AMT calculator, we have a fairness calculator, we have an equity outcome simulator, that's all the sort of, and we have a dashboard sort of looking like- I think uh, someone asked for an equity outcome simulator. Uh, earlier on yeah i can put that in chat but basically we're doing all of this to help people make sense of their equity and to, to be clear what about amt so if you have really valuable equity like let's say you're an uber employee who's been with the company for uber is now five years old you've been there for five years you now have a hefty amt bill can you guys help cover that um, so it all it's a it's a mathematical thing. We'll we'll cover every all the cash need that you have um and at a at a share price we agreed to, right? So if we're covering more, um we would just take you would basically be grant invested more shares. Um so we can cover as much or as little um as our customers want. And there are secondary markets that are also popping up, which are slightly different. They don't help you exercise, but if you do have the shares, they help you get some liquidity. Um, and so yeah. things like um, equity Zen might be one or shares post or second market. I'm, I'm equity B. Um, the, the thing to know about secondary market and especially in, in this market is um, uh, sometimes there's a role for process you have to go through and that could take, weeks so if you're using them or if you already own your shares and you're looking for liquidity you can wait right but if you're sort of in that 90 day exercise window and you're doing this liquidity secondary market as part of the financing to to buy your shares hmm. be mindful of the off the timeline yeah that might i can imagine that would be really complicated if you're if you don't own the shares yet but you're selling them is basically what you're saying it can get pretty stressful yeah <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'm we're just out of time. There's so much more to cover that we didn't get to talk about, but I'd love to open up the floor to questions. I believe there's a way to uh, request to join um, the, the stage so that you can ask your question or you can post it into the chat and we'll go from there. Uh, so I'll start with the most recent one we've gotten from Leah or Leah. 
Um, so because 90 days and 10 years are an order of magnitude of difference, are there a couple of examples of the trend towards 10 year expiration windows that are useful to cite during negotiation? Um, I think someone actually posted a link. Um, if you scroll up, I believe, yes. Uh, perfect. Uh, so we have a question from Rachel. Is it reasonable in a contract to have information about what percentage of equity will be paid out versus put into an escrow account? I have never heard this. So Melody, I feel like maybe you know something about this. I would say it's not reasonable only because if your company goes through a sale and this is a, a scenario that comes up, you're not going to know before it happens what's going to be negotiated between the parties, between the buyer and, and your company. Um, so I, I don't think it's something you can ask for up front. Um, that's all. These are all negotiated terms in a merger or a, an acquisition. Yeah, Rachel, I've never heard of something like that. I'm not a lawyer, but just like talking to people, I've never heard of anything like that. So it seems like one of those. It, it, it is a, it's, a, a it's a good question to be thinking about, definitely, because, I mean, this is generally a good topic to, to, to discuss as it relates to what happens, you know, when a company does go through a sale. Um, VCs have liquidation preferences. And if you follow that track, that means, you know, all the preferred stock has to get paid out before any of the common stock and then any of the option holders. So there's also a lot more to think about in terms of, you know, just because your company is receiving a, a chunk of change and being bought out, it doesn't actually mean you might receive anything. Um, Molly, would you consider it a red flag for them to be asking her to sign that up front? To sign? To so have to have this escrow account thing kind of defined up front. Is that like, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I've never seen that. Um, I wouldn't sign anything up front to that effect. Rachel, I hope that was helpful. Um, we're getting some questions about public companies, RSUs or ISOs. So generally with public companies, you're going to see RSUs being issued. Um, a lot of why RSUs start to be issued over ISOs really comes down to the valuation of the company. So once you exceed a certain valuation, you're reaching strike prices that are just really unattainable. And at, at a certain point in time, you know, as an employee, you're not going to, if your strike price is like a hundred dollars a share and you have thousands of shares, most people don't have the, the cash to, to pay for that, to exercise. And that's the point in which RSUs come into play um, and, and are issued because you don't, you no longer have to worry about having liquidity to exercise those shares. So I wouldn't. I was going to say for a public company, you the the calculation is different because your equity is sellable and worth something today. For the most part, there are some lockup periods. Correct. Right? Correct. Yep, that's true. Uh, do we have any other questions? I, I did, Melody, you, you briefly mentioned this, and I just want to say, like, I, I want this concept to be on everyone's radar, but we didn't really go into it. Liquidation preferences. Uh, you, you like just that one sentence you gave, like, I want to emphasize, like you might not like a VC liquidation preferences can easily prevent you from making money because you are at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to paying out shareholders. Um, usually VCs get not just preferred stock, but a preference. So they might be, have a baked in multiple that they need to get back on their money before you get paid. Yeah, yeah, in fact, someone on my team um, had a, a, an acquisition, a merger where the um, actually the the multiple on the preferred stack was so high, such that the you know after the acquisition, all of the gains went to the the pre pref stack, and the common stock was you know nominal. <laughs> there was barely anything, um, and so that's definitely something to be. But my, my general philosophy, though, maybe a controversial point of view on um, dilution and acquisition is that you, you can't really control it, you know, it, and it's hard to predict it. Um, so as long as the company is sort of uh, growing and the valuation is increasing, you would hope that your options get a handsome payout. Um, yeah, that's is that opinion. something you can ask when you join the company? Like, is that like something you think a founder would answer? Like, are there like, does your cap table have any liquidation preferences? I think for sure. And in fact, it would, it would be, a, I think we should ask that. We should ask last round before you should ask about just sort of 409A and how often and sort of ask about the last two 409As. And, and if they're just either shady, not willing to tell you or they didn't have a 409A, all of those are, 
information, right? Data point. Um, but the thing to know about pref stack too is that the founders don't necessarily control it as especially as they go through more financing. I know for a fact that in today, like right now, the, the fundraising right now, VCs are asking for very aggressive and very innovative kind of uh, pr preferences. Um, and that's something that founders and, and are, 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 are combating. And one thing I want to call out is that like when a founder is resistant to certain pieces of information, sometimes it's just because no employee has, or, or interviewee has ever asked them for that before. And I've definitely been like, oh, like there's a candidate who's asked a question I've never been asked before. It, I, I guess it, it matters how gracefully they answer the question, but just know that sometimes they're like, oh, most employees, don't, like most candidates don't ask. I'm not used to having to, 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 to give that information. Um, Ling, Melody, can you guys speak at all about QSBS tax exclusion? Um, so it sounds like someone has, uh, they're eligible this year. I really wouldn't want to mis mislead you. I think this is an area that, again, best to speak to a, um, a CPA. Yeah, just some of the, the, the very basics, which I think we covered, are just you have to hold the shares for a minimum of, of five years um, to, to not bust QSBS. And then, again, at that point, the up to $10 million in gains would be non-taxable. But yeah, I would I would discuss that in further detail with an accountant. Awesome. Um, I love Rain's question here. Um, so if you really believe in a company, you think it's going to go public, um, you think your options are going to be worth something, you can afford them. What do you what should you look for when you're negotiating? I would negotiate for more personally, like just get more options. Uh, Rain, can you clarify? Are you, are you looking for a specific clause or something that you want? Like, how how should we answer? Uh, in the meantime, Deb's asking if we can discuss more about RSU refresher grants. Yeah, so just to to touch on Rain's question, yeah, this one's kind of hard to answer. Obviously, the more equity you can get, the better. Um, but I think in this case, if if you know you can definitely pay pay for the shares, um, and you really believe in the company, trying to push for the early exercise ability can really go a long way for you, um, because. You know, you're, you know you have the ability to pay and you're really avoiding a lot of the taxes that would come with waiting to exercise in that case. Can you ask to, this is a question for Melody then actually on, on legal, can you ask to backdate your, your strike price? Like you, the first grant, no, <laughs> that's just for the first I'm getting, grant. I'm getting hives as you ask me that question. <laughs> Unfortunately, backdating is a big, big no-no in my profession. And it really, again, this all comes down to the IRS they're, they're the sticklers. Um, you, can't, you can't pretend something happened two or three months before if it didn't happen. And that's, if, if you do get caught, it could, the, the, the penalty and, and the risk is just like, it's not worth it. It could completely um, invalidate the option that you hold and you could you know, effectively own nothing and be paying lots of money and penalties for, for what you're doing. So to, to be clear, what you suggested previously is to negotiate for some other sort of recourse if the strike price is different. Oh, yeah. So in the case where you don't get your, your equity like soon after you um, sign your offer letter, yes, I would definitely keep an eye on financing events because those are ultimately what affect strike prices um, over time. Um, or they're the biggest driver. And so if you're noticing that it's been months and months and suddenly the company is kicking off a financing or closing one, it's a, it's a red flag if you haven't already received your equity at that point. Uh, okay, so we have Rain up here on stage. Would you, I'd love to have you clarify your question and, and see if we can. Yeah, um, just, I, I think you basically answered it because it can vary. <clears throat> it can vary so much, like it is tough to answer, but um, under those circumstances, I was wondering, like, would there be, um, you know, anything to try and like negotiate upfront for like the, um, I don't know, like once the product launches, having a conversation about a certain range of equity to have increased or renegotiate for, like trying to get ahead of those upcoming conversations um, yeah. In addition yeah. to like sign on percentage. 
It's a good question, actually. And, and I think this comes back to the vesting we discussed, where you have your typical time-based vesting schedule, which is generally the four-year vest. I have definitely seen cases where um, milestone vesting comes into play. So, you know, subject to the launch of a, an, a minimum viable product or some milestone, you would receive a certain number of shares or subject to that milestone hitting, you would start the vesting of new shares. If you can negotiate for that initially with your like basic for your vest grant, you then, if you think about it, you get the benefit of of the cheaper strike price, potentially cheaper strike price on all of those options, even if this product might not launch for three years or four years. It ultimately, again, works to your benefit because you're getting cheaper equity. Um, so that's a, that's a big one and, and definitely something I would push for. That's, that's very interesting. interesting. Meant with back, but yeah, it's, so it's not backdating as long as you negotiated a milestone schedule upfront. Uh, Correct. Correct. Yeah, you could you could have something be subject to this in six years. That's not backdating. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. But the reason I will just say that a company might fight you on that is at the end of the day, them issuing you equity is dwindling their pool and the number of shares that they have to grant to other people. Um, and so that's why they're probably going to push back and say, like, no, we do not want to, you know, further decrease what we have available to to hire others. Yeah, I feel like you really have to try and come up with your, like as a candidate, your unique value prop, like really go to bat for it as to why. Yep. I mean, Rain, if you're, I think like if I was in the situation that you're describing where I really believe something's valuable, like my fear would be not getting enough and not getting any. So like you'd want to make sure that like you have as much equity as possible and that like you don't really know what's going to happen at the time you leave. So you want to make sure you have as much time to make a decision as possible. So that would be like the 10 year. Even if you can afford your stock, you still want to make sure that you have the time to make the decision. Okay. So if they don't <clears throat> if they don't propose the 10 year timeline, then a lot that. of employees do request it. Like okay. someone asks whether or not something can be negotiated after the fact. It's hard. You know, like it's it takes work for founders to support that. It's not like not all of them are chomping at the bit to do it, but it is something that can be asked for. Um, and I've seen like my cousin's company did, like they requested it and the founders gave it to them. And I don't know legally what that looked like, but it is something that people have requested. Got it. Thanks. Um, okay, so I think Rachel Wynn has a question about secondaries. What, what to consider when a VC offers to buy back options that you've previously exercised? And would that be considered a secondary? So just to clarify the question, are we talking about vested equity? I assume. Uh, I mean, if they've exercised it, I would assume that it was for the most part vested. Like a tender offer? Could So could be a tender offer. That's just a variation of a secondary. Yeah, this would be considered a secondary sale. Um, I'd say biggest things to consider are um, what price they're offering it at, offering to, to buy the shares at. So... Generally, it'll be pegged to the, the most recent preferred price. Sometimes it happens in connection with a financing round. Um, if your best case scenario, it's at 100% of the preferred price, meaning it's the same. Um, worst case, it's like you know, somewhere between 50 to 90% of what the preferred price was. I'd say all of that is within range and reasonable. It just depends on um, how the company's doing and... Um, yeah how, yeah, how other things are playing out. I, you know, I, this, this area, I know, I know maybe not enough about, but I, I was told generally that if you get a tender offer for a hundred percent of last round preferred, take it. That's kind of the best deal you're going to get. If you get between 50 and 90%, well, depending on sort of um, how close you are to that 100%, it doesn't hard to shop around on those secondary platforms like equity B um, because you do see buyers out there for that, you know, 70, 80% range. Um, and the worst case is you'd have to go through a role for a uh, right of first refusal for the board to say whether or not they want to buy back. But the, it's like, if they, refused your sale to the the other buyers then they are basically offering to buy it so so it doesn't hurt but it's it is a more uh, uh, protracted 
uh, process. Um, so yeah. Can I add one thing to that, which is I think it depends on whether or not you're really looking to sell. So I think there is a difference between I have this offer and I wasn't looking to sell, but now it's here versus like I'm looking to sell and I have this the secondary or tender offer from BC. If you're looking to sell, it sounds like Ling, what you're saying is like, you should definitely do it. But yeah. I've definitely had the opportunity to get liquidity on stock in the past from like an investor and made the decision to hold on to it instead. And in my case, I got lucky and the company didn't go up under and the valuation went up. And so like, if I were to get liquidity today, it would be worth more than what I would have gotten then. But I still haven't gotten liquidity, so I don't know if it was the right decision yet. <laughs> yeah, definitely a risk reward analysis. Yeah. Um, but I, I think if cash is being offered to you today, there's definitely good reason to consider maybe taking it. Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm going to wrap up there. I know we've gone a little bit over and I want to be respectful of our wonderful panelists' time. Um, there's... <laughs> Um, well, you doing that? I see that Deb asked about RSU refresher grant. I'm not super close to RSU. Maybe Melody can speak to this. I know that right now a lot of companies uh, is off, well, not offering. A lot of employees are asking to right size um, their RSU given the the uh, public market tumbling. So that's something being discussed extensively on TeamBlind.com. Uh, with that uh, refresher grant. Melody, do you know much about sort of refresher grant? When I, I think the question is just refresher grants, meaning like um, getting a, a grant again after being in a company for a year or two years or or something like that. I'm I'm assuming that's the question. Um, would work similarly to options where it's it's the same concept. So after you've been with a company for a certain amount of time, they either want to promote you or try to for retention purposes, give you some more RSUs. And those RSUs, again, would be subject to a similar vesting schedule, likely the same vesting schedule you have on your prior RSUs. Um, and this, the process would work similarly. Awesome. Uh, thank you guys so much both for your time. Um, I know this was a really fascinating discussion and I learned so much. Uh, keep an eye.